Ben Knight, and I'm a director of Demet's Forbes Knight Architects. What is DMFK's design process? Um, design process is generally, we try and keep it the same for every project. Um, the initial stages are all about analysis and taking a good brief from the client. So it's, it's going back to basics on you know, where, what the orientation of the site is, where the site boundaries are, what the influence is on the site, uh, what the topography is, whether there's any existing buildings on the site, the archaeology. Um, so it's finding out the fundamentals, because only through understanding what the, the basics are can you get the right product out of, out of the project. And then getting to know your client um, some of the best projects we've ever done are ones where um, we've got to know the client really, really well and you have to become really good friends with them um, and you know, sort of going out for a drink with them, going out for dinner, really understanding them as a person and it doesn't really matter what kind of project it is, whether it's a house, a restaurant, uh, an office development, um, school to really understand what they're like as people and what they want is you just get the best quality product. Our process after that tends to be um, the three of us will get together and brainstorm and with the guys in the office look at precedent um, and uh, come up with some as best ideas as we can as a reaction to the problems. Um, we tend to uh, do a lot of drawing by hand at that stage, uh, getting uh, SketchUp models made, um, but it is, a, it, it is quite a linear process um, through that and then you're understanding the planning parameters, building control, all those sorts of things and reiterating ideas until you come up with something that's really got some potential. What makes the company unique? What makes us unique? I guess it's about um, our approach to, to context and we, you know, we love uh, patina in buildings and you know, we love things to wear well uh, that's going to stand the test of time. You know, we, 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 I've, for example, I've banned using timber cladding on our buildings because it, I go around town and I just uh, see all these badly worn buildings. I think it's really important that um, you know, buildings need to last a long time. Um, unless it's a temporary building, of course, and then it's fine. But um, so I think it's a, yeah, it's a combination of the, the three of our characters in the office and our approach to you know, building things that will will last. Um, <clears throat> can you tell us a bit about Eastbourne Terrace? Yeah, um, th this is a, um, a really one of my favourite projects, actually, certainly of the, of the last couple of years. Um, it's quite a big project for, uh, for us in terms of uh, the size of it, it's about 40,000 square feet and it's in the uh, uh, west side of Paddington Station, uh, runs, it's a very long building, it's about half a kilometre long and uh, we're doing uh, probably a, a quarter of its length over four floors. Um, this is originally designed by Brunel, uh, it's Grade 1 listed and uh, Network Rail had been in occupation in the building for the last 30 or 40 years. Originally it was built for the Great Western Railway, it was their accountant's offices and the lucky accountants had ballroom spaces, they were just like, the scale of these rooms is absolutely insane. Uh, the lovely view over Eastbourne Terrace one side and the railway tracks on the other. And um, yeah, Network Rail had been in there and absolutely trashed the place, putting cable trays through grade one listed cornices, covering up the most beautiful plasterwork ceilings and bashing holes through things for chiller pipe work. They just had no respect for the building whatsoever. And uh, it was my client uh, quite bravely took a, a lease for a number of years in conjunction, uh, sorry, from Network Rail. It's kind of a joint venture. Uh, to convert it into serviced offices. We've done a couple of other buildings for them and uh, this is the first one we've done for a couple of years and they've, they've been talking to other architects and um, uh, they came to us for this one and it was just fascinating just uncovering layers of 1970s ceilings and 
furniture and you know, just like partitions built up against amazing things and discovery. Um, so we were around when it was being stripped out and, and we, we had to develop the design as we saw more and more things be being revealed. Um, and the the architecture of the building, uh, well, it, it's, it's not really architecture, it's fit-out work, is, is all about putting stuff back into the building that is appropriate to its age and its classification as a grade one building, but making it clear that what's new is new. So we, we're not taking a pastiche approach about it, it's all about being you know, clear about what's new. Um, so we, we try to do that through the detailing, uh, because it's in a serviced office, you need to partition it. Uh, some of the spaces where we fought very hard to, like the, the main ballroom space, to not actually put any partitioning in there and to try and create divisions within the space by uh, low level screens and such like. So, um, we, it, was, it was fun to develop a, uh, a language that could be used throughout the building. Um, a lot of that language had to come from the servicing uh, so it's, it's exposed services but in one room we couldn't really have exposed services so it's, it developed a language of furniture that was also servicing and also dividing, dividing the room. You have carried out many private and social housing schemes. Um, do you think it's important to preserve old buildings or build new ones? I think it's important to preserve old buildings if they're worthy of preservation um, and it's important to understand where you can knock something down and rebuild it and to, for how you make that judgement. Sometimes it's quite subjective where you actually, where the line is that you draw between good enough to keep or bad enough to knock down. Uh, but I think they're both equally important, just making that, making that judgement of which is the right place. How do you approach the design of the Urban Splash Islington site for the affordable housing? How do we approach it? Well, um, that was such a long time ago. <laughs> um, we, um, in, in our interview, uh, we, we, all three of us went up and uh, were interviewed by uh, was Urban Splash and uh, some reps from Man Meth. And uh, the, there was also a couple of people from the, the residents themselves. And I think you know, we, we won that job because we were quite approachable. And we actually re re recognised that our client was actually the, the guys whose houses we were designing. And whilst Man Meth were paying the bills and setting the parameters to what we were doing, as were Urban Splash in terms of the parameters of the master plan. Yeah, we we recognised that our client was um, you know, the the um, uh, the little old lady who lived who lived next to the Rastafarian guy, uh, next to the family of, of five. You know, so it's all these different people uh, that that were our client on that. So that was what kind of won us the job. I think. Um, and our approach initially was to uh, understand from them what their criteria were. Um, so again, it's going back to basics, getting to know your client. We, we split up into team, uh, three teams. We just went around as individuals to all, all of their houses and sort of made notes. And we had a checklist of what they wanted. And uh, the analysis from all that was that actually, bar a few things, everybody wanted the same thing, which was a nice house with a number of bedrooms with lots of light, a kitchen in the middle of the house, um, and a garden. Yeah, then it's like sort of quite basic and obvious everyday normal person requirements. Um, and I think they'd sort of been that they'd been a little bit tired by the process before, which was there was an awful lot of uh, consultation. And I think they they just wanted uh, to get it done. I think so. There wasn't there wasn't any particularly big demands that anybody made of us. The project was built on time and on budget. How did yeah. you do that? <laughs> we didn't. We didn't really have a choice in that. We um, we we delivered all of our drawings uh, ahead of schedule because I think there was there was a lot, a lot of behind the scenes procurement issues going on. Uh, the client was finding a contractor, um, 
tying up the, the financial deal. Meanwhile, we just carried on doing all the drawings. And when they came to start on site, there wasn't this usual sort of thing, right, Mr. Architect, when are you going to give us your drawings? They were already there. So uh, I think that was just the, the method of procurement was very sensible, where you, you, it's design and build, but you get an elevated to the contractor rather than this sort of employer's requirement setting and then doing your stage uh, F and G after that whole thing's been tied up. So it, yeah, it's, it worked, worked quite well. What advice would you give to young architects and students? Um, uh, work hard um, and just know everything. Know, know more, just as much as the structural engineer knows about your project, know everything about the context. It's only through knowing and knowledge about what job you're working on can you really get a good solution. Um, and you know, some people have said to me, how do I get experience? So I was only through knowing on your job more than anybody else and just sticking with it. And um, yes, yeah, you guys know the only way of getting experience is to work hard and get it, you know? Um, <laughs> work in your school holidays for an architect, work in your summer holidays, work in your Christmas holidays, just being in an architect's office, even if you have to do it for free, just being in an office is the most important thing. And um, just have your ears open at all times in the office, listen to what's going on around you. And, um, even though it's not relevant to your job, you, sort of, you just pick stuff up. There's nothing worse than wearing your headphones in an office because you don't know what's going on or you know, anything. So.